Welcome to Health Now from WebMD. I'm your host, Carrie Gann. The public health community is marking a major milestone this month, four decades since the emergence of HIV AIDS. Today, we're talking with one of the public health pioneers who took charge of the crisis from the very beginning, working to identify the cause of the new mysterious disease and stop it from spreading. He'll also tell us how the HIV AIDS crisis informed efforts to control the COVID pandemic and what could be ahead for HIV treatments and a vaccine. Before we hear that conversation, a quick check-in. Have you subscribed to our show yet? Take a second if you can and make sure so you don't miss any of our great episodes. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. On June 5, 1981, the CDC published a report on five cases of a type of pneumonia in gay men. Since then, HIV-AIDS has become a global pandemic, with more than 75 million cases and more than 32 million deaths among men, women, and children around the world. From the start, scientists went all in. How did this new disease spread? What could help prevent it? Could they make a vaccine to stop it? Today, we're talking to one of the leading scientists who's worked on HIV AIDS from the beginning, Dr. James Curran. In 1981, Dr. Curran worked at the CDC where he coordinated the Task Force on AIDS or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, and then led the CDC's HIV AIDS division. While at the CDC, he became Assistant Surgeon General. Dr. Curran is now the Dean of the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta, and he's also with the Emory Center for AIDS Research. Dr. Curran, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Carrie. It's good to see you. Take us back to the earliest days of the AIDS crisis. What were the first reports or signs that the disease was emerging? Well, the first reports of uh, what is now termed AIDS were cases of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia an opportunistic infection occurring in gay men and then uh, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York. The first reports came from Los Angeles, but soon thereafter, it was found that they were occurring in uh, other California cities as well as New York. A very unusual cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, was also seen in some of these gay men and also separately. And it was known that Kaposi sarcoma was a cancer that was more common in people whose immune systems were compromised. At CDC, we immediately began by determining how frequent the cases were. And we established a case definition and then began active surveillance throughout the United States. So it was pretty unusual to see that kind of a disease, especially in young people who had been previously healthy. Was that what made it sort of stand out? CDC had been distributing drugs uh, to treat pneumocystis pneumonia, and only in uh, one case since 1967 had it been found that the condition was occurring in people without underlying cancer or immunosuppressive therapy. So it was very unusual to see such severely ill people with no underlying cause, and the disease was very, very severe and ultimately found to be universally fatal. I see. Do you remember where you were when you first heard about these cases? I was chief of the research branch of the SCD control division when the draft article came across my desk a few days before it was published. Uh, we had been involved in hepatitis B vaccine studies in gay men and had worked with many people in the gay community during the epidemic of hepatitis B that was ongoing. So it was brought to my attention uh, because of our uh, previous and ongoing efforts with the gay community. Was there a point at which you knew that this was going to be one of the biggest health challenges of a generation and a big part of your life's work as well? The CDC was well known for responding to epidemics. And in recent years before that, uh, had dealt with Legionnaire's disease, toxic shock syndrome, and other types of problems. So despite the uh, lack of budget, the CDC was very anxious and uh, willing to divert personnel, including myself, uh, for 90 days initially to investigate how important the problem is. Although we didn't know what was causing this, we found that it seemed to be increasing rapidly 
uh, doubling in cases every few months, and that it affected people outside of New York and California as well. It sounds like it was a lot bigger than just those initial reports. Like once you actually started looking into it, you realized that there were quite a number of people who had actually been infected. Well, by by looking at the case definition, it's important to recognize that the virus wasn't discovered for two to three years later. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't be certain that it was an infectious disease causing it. What we had was an epidemic of severe immune suppression uh, leading to severe infections and cancers and ultimately death. We knew that the cases were all very, very serious and they were remarkable. Most physicians who saw even one case had never seen anything like it during their lifetime. By conducting active surveillance, we could isolate the problem to some extent and we learned that it was new in the United States. Uh, virtually no cases were initially detected, even going backwards to before 1978. And the active surveillance led to identification of patterns. Uh, cases were soon identified in heterosexual men uh, who were injecting drugs, uh, then in their sexual partners themselves. Persons mysteriously uh, from Haiti who had recently come to the United States both men and women. And then finally, I think most tellingly in persons who had hemophilia. The cases in hemophilia were exceptionally important because at the time hemophiliacs were well known to uh, universally get hepatitis B, another virus which was transmitted uh, in a pattern very similar to what looked like AIDS. And they had received blood from uh, literally hundreds of thousands of donors through the use of uh, the untreated factor concentrates to compensate for their hemophilia. These cases pretty much proved to everybody that whatever it was that caused AIDS was most likely to be a virus that was transmitted through sexual contact and through blood. And eventually we found from infected mothers to their newborns. By 1983, 1984, uh, the virus was discovered. What were some of the, the key challenges in your HIV work back then? Um, you obviously you know, were chasing these cases all over the country, and you had to put a lot of pieces together that eventually led you to those conclusions. But what were some of the challenges you came upon in identifying the virus and then you know, trying to educate people about how to prevent it? Well, the first challenge, of course, was finding out the cause of AIDS and convincing people that it was an important growing problem. Since most of the cases were from California and New York, that led to a persistent denial that it was only a problem found in those states. Uh, since most cases were occurring initially in gay men, that allowed people to say, well, it can't happen to us, it only happens in gay men. And the cases were not large in number. Uh, in a sense, only a few thousand, but they were very, very serious and inevitably led to death. Perhaps the most important thing we did in addition to investigating the cases was to come up with recommendations for prevention uh, before the cause was found. And we did this for healthcare and laboratory workers. Healthcare workers were afraid to take care of patients with AIDS and, and laboratory workers were afraid to receive specimens and then eventually people were able to be guided uh, not to donate blood if they were at high risk for AIDS. And all of this could happen, these recommendations, before the cause was even discovered. And that would make it easy for people to take precautions when they're caring for patients or dealing with specimens in the lab, and also to avoid multiple sexual partners to prevent themselves from getting AIDS and to avoid donating blood to prevent others uh, from getting AIDS. I see. Are there stories from that time that really stick with you, either about your work or about what people were going through during this crisis? Well, the first man I saw um, with AIDS was a man who had gone to Catholic prep school in Detroit uh, the same year I did. Uh, he then went to Yale and I went to Notre Dame and uh, I went, became a physician and he became an actor. He began his condition with blotches of 
the skin cancer, Kaposi sarcoma on his face. And I, of course, never seen a case like this. And he asked me when I saw him in New York, is there any way these could go away? Uh, that if perhaps they wouldn't be so bad so he could continue his acting career. I subsequently saw him on four or five more occasions visiting New York as he, uh, his condition deteriorated. He was given therapy for his cancer. Uh, that made him worse actually, developed serious pneumonia. And eventually during the last visit I saw him about a year later, uh, he passed away in the ICU at New York University Hospital. And all I could think about actually was that how similar we were and how different our outcomes were. We were both young boys in, in Detroit. Uh, both went to Catholic prep schools. We both went to private colleges. Um, the difference was that he was exposed to something which led to his very early death and I wasn't. I would go on to see, of course, many dozens of other people pass away when we could essentially do nothing for them uh, as doctors. It really wasn't until 1995 that any therapy was effective. I want to talk about, since you brought up treatments, I want to go into those a little bit to the options that people have today once they've become infected. You know, a lot of these treatments that we have really can make HIV a chronic condition rather than a life-threatening one that, you know, immediately or very quickly leads to death. Is that correct? Yes. The first uh, drug that was used for AIDS was AZT. That was a, an old cancer drug thought to be too toxic for cancer and shown to have some partial effect of people with AIDS. Unfortunately, the drug itself was not good enough, but it was a proof of principle that developed, uh, led to development of many, many other drugs. And then eventually to highly active therapy, which was a combination of three drugs shown to have a real Lazarus effect. People would essentially come out of their death knell and, and be able to go back to work in a few weeks. It was amazing. Wow. And today there's things like PrEP even that can, you know, a healthy person can take them and, and prevent themselves from getting the virus as well. Well, amazingly, you know, science uh, uh, has developed a great deal since uh, 40 years ago. You know, when I was in medical school, people would say, well, you can treat a bacteria, but you can't treat a virus. So mm. people were amazed when highly active antiretroviral therapy was effective. But another thing was the measurement of the amount of virus in the blood, the so-called viral load. And it soon became known that treatment of HIV itself would reduce the amount of virus in the blood. Of course, not surprising. But that also reduced the amount of virus in semen and vaginal secretions. And that meant that by treating people, you could actually prevent transmission. So it really tied together uh, the importance of medical care and treatment and prevention. So one of the hallmarks of HIV prevention is the identification and continued treatment of people with HIV and adherence to therapy. Just talking about these treatments, you know, comparing them to what was available for the earliest patients who had AIDS, which was basically nothing was available to help them. There has been such tremendous progress uh, since those early days. And even in other aspects of the disease, you know, I read a report this morning that HIV cases have dropped by about 75% in the last 40 years. You know, there were about 130,000 cases per year in the mid 80s. And in 2019, there were less than 35,000 cases. But a lot of challenges still remain in HIV AIDS. What are some of the key ones that you see, particularly here in the US? Well, whenever we talk about a pandemic or an epidemic, you got to begin with the organism itself or the virus itself. And the primary problem with HIV is that. When a person is infected, they're infected for life. There's essentially uh, no cure. Uh, therapy must be taken for life. And so you have a situation where people become infected and they need lifelong treatment. The other part of the issue is that early infection, uh, often for several years, is essentially silent. So many people become infected, but don't know it. 
And even in the United States now, perhaps 15% or so of the 1.2 million people with HIV are unaware they're infected. Wow. And that means that a lot of people are kind of having sex in a sea of ignorance when it comes to HIV in many communities in the United States. So early detection is not inevitable. As a matter of fact, it's, it, it usually doesn't happen unless you have very active screening programs and contact tracing programs. So those are the two major problems. And then of course, the fact that it lasts for life implies that unlike many viruses like COVID, for example, there's no effective immune response that the human has against HIV that you can mimic by having a safe and effective vaccine. So, so far, HIV vaccines to prevent infection uh, have been elusive. You know, many trials have been done. There's still a lot of work being done, but it's not going to be any relatively easy answer like COVID has been. So we don't have a, a curative therapy and we don't have effective vaccines. And we have 35 million carriers throughout the world who uh, still are at risk of dying and a great risk of transmitting to others. I'm glad you mentioned the COVID vaccine because that has been, you know, one of the, the real success stories in the past year, this, you know, scientists being able to create a vaccine for this virus in record time. And that really compares pretty starkly with, you know, the fact that we've had this, this HIV epidemic for 40 years and there's not a vaccine. So it sounds like you're saying that the, the difference in the virus itself and the body's response to it can account for, you know, is part of that reason. Are there other reasons that there's just, there hasn't been an effective vaccine developed in a few decades at this point? Well, of course, COVID-19 is the public health crisis of the century. You know, we've not had anything like this in my lifetime or the lifetime really of anyone um, who currently exists. And that's because it's so rapidly spread and it, it has a high fatality rate. But COVID has a few advantages over HIV. And the major ones are that it's a very short duration. I mean, uh, it only lasts about three weeks. So that means that although this is not really possible, if everyone in the world were to be isolated by themselves for three weeks, the, they would all go away. Hmm. Because, you know, so that's why there's so much fluctuation in uh, incidence of COVID over time, because you can have a measure which can greatly reduce COVID and, and a lot of isolation, closing things, and it just shuts down transmission. And then of course you relax the measures and it goes back up again. Mm -hmm. We've seen that several times in the last year or so. <laughs> so, you know, COVID, SARS COVID-2 and, and HIV are both RNA viruses. They both mutate quite frequently. The difference is that the human body has an effective immune response against COVID in most cases, you know, not all, but most cases. And with HIV, there's really no effective permanent immune response. And that makes it difficult to mimic that. Uh, there are antibodies, but the antibodies essentially don't prevent infection. Mm. So that still has to be worked on. And then the silent nature of the infection is important. Now, now fortunately, it's much harder to transmit than COVID. Right. Uh, but uh, but it tra it's transmitted silently, and that, that makes it very difficult. And then just like from the very beginning, and, and more than almost any other infection, comes the stigma and discrimination. Uh, any infection which is fatal, which causes often disease, like, even like COVID, uh, comes with it discrimination and stigma. But the association with sexual contact, with drug use, with homosexuality, and sexual transmission uh, makes HIV extremely uh, associated with stigma and discrimination. And these are big barriers. Uh, people are afraid to get tested, not only because they may not want to know, but they don't want anyone else to know. Do you think that kind of stigma affected also the development of treatments and a vaccine for HIV in, in those, especially early on? Well, I think there was, there was no question that the United States and the Reagan administration neglected AIDS 
in large part because it was occurring in focal groups of gay men. And it was easy to neglect that. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't say the word AIDS in public until 1987. Oh, my. If you can imagine that. Wow. Now, you know, uh, Tony Fauci was working on that, too. We worked together. And uh, the NIH and the CDC were working very hard, uh, sometimes with limited personnel and limited funds. But there was some support in Congress for this. But I think that there's no question that having this occur in the gay community was a barrier to acceptance as a problem. Mm -hmm. But also the mode of transmission was a, was a barrier. Right. Now, I have to say that in, in my experience, there hasn't been anything as effective community response as we saw with the gay community in AIDS. So you had people uh, who were advocating for this, including uh, Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York, ACT UP with Larry Kramer. Many other people were actively lobbying and demonstrating for better therapies, for better recognition, for better support. And they were informed. They, they knew about therapies. They, you know, not only picketed the FDA, but they actually advised the FDA and the CDC and the NIH. And, you know, sometimes their, their activities were um, difficult to deal with if, if mm -hmm. they chained themselves to my office door or uh, <laughs> put outside the CDC or the NIH or the FDA. I guess a couple times I was spit on. Tony Fauci is, was attacked many, many times for various wow. things. But, you know, that what they did was important because they called attention to the problem. They were informed and they were dying. I mean, we would see them and then there'd be a meeting three months later and we'd say, where is so-and-so, you know? And they say, mm -hmm. well, he passed away. Oh my. It was a reminder that the people were fighting for their lives and they were doing so courageously. They were coming out of the closet uh, to their families, to the people they worked with, not only in desperation, but in service to the pandemic. Yeah, that was some really extraordinary activism um, by, by those people early on, especially, you know, when they were, had to be, have been terrified um, for what was going to happen to them. Yeah, they were going to funerals all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, you know, it remains a major cause of death in gay men, but it was so far ahead of anything else as a cause of death in gay men. And in the United States, it was the leading cause of death, period, in people 25 to 49 in the 1980s. Wow. So it was, you know, the, the, the youth of people who were having these horrible, uh, ignominious illnesses and dying was uh, inspiring and, and depressing. Right, and unforgettable also. Do you expect there will be an HIV vaccine one day? Uh, might the mRNA technology that was used to develop the COVID vaccine be of any help? Well, I think that, you know, we really need a vaccine and we need curative therapy. I guess if we had curative therapy, that would even be my preference mm -hmm. um, because then we could eliminate carriers, eliminate the need for lifelong therapy and embark in a very comprehensive testing campaign to find people who are infected. And a lot of people are working on curative therapies and they're also working on, on vaccines. A safe and effective vaccine would also be extremely valuable. Um, and I think that that is a possibility. Now, I think we're going to see mRNA technology used for many vaccines. The first thing I think of is influenza. Mm. Um, we desperately need an influenza vaccine, which is better than a new one every year. Right. And the technology of mRNA allows a pretty rapid development of new strains, which has been a barrier for flu vaccines. And, and I think we're going to see, you know, how the COVID situation works out. But I'm, I'm uh, very impressed with the utility of that technology. How do you think the response to the COVID pandemic was shaped by the response to the HIV AIDS pandemic that unfolded, you know, obviously many years before, but were there lessons learned that people dealing with COVID were able to apply, or were there those that they ignored, in your opinion, that might have been helpful for getting things under control faster? Well, the developing world has seen 
for many, many decades, uh, large amounts of infectious disease. You know, most recently and continuously tuberculosis and malaria, uh, childhood diseases, rotavirus infections. But by the 1970s, uh, the United States and, and other more developed countries had sort of said, well, we're near the end of infectious disease. You know, we don't have to worry about infectious diseases anymore. Mm. Yeah, sure, there's a hepatitis and there are some sexually transmitted infections, but we've sort of vanquished infectious diseases with our therapies and our vaccines. Uh, if you just think one country. But what HIV proved, and we've seen now with uh, influenza viruses and SARS, and now especially SARS CoV 2, is that viruses can emerge from animals, our zoonoses, like HIV, like SARS-CoV-2, and they can be transmitted throughout the world. The viruses don't need passports or visas. Mm. Uh, they go everywhere. And HIV told us that a virus can come and kill 35 or 40 million people throughout the world, and that you can't really vanquish a virus in, only in your country. Mm. And then, of course, Ebola did the same thing, although more difficult to transmit and easier to vanquish. And then SARS, uh, and now finally COVID. So we need a global system of detection and response and a global partnership uh, to deal with viruses. And HIV was the wake-up call for a, a sleeping America that these kinds of things could happen. And unfortunately, for 40 years, we are still not done. Hopefully, what we do in this pandemic will affect what happens possibly the next time that one comes around. You know, it's an opportunity to learn lessons. And unfortunately, sometimes those lessons are, are rapidly forgotten. But I think we'll learn some lessons from COVID and hopefully make uh, some changes. Certainly. My final question for you, you know, back in 1981, we've mentioned several times that the first cases of HIV were described in gay men. But since then, HIV AIDS has affected all genders, sexual orientations, ages around the world, everywhere, as we were just talking about. Do you think people really recognize their own risk? Well, you know, part of this is a question of denial. The gay community initially uh, was able to deny the risk if they would say it's only those, you know, those people in New York and California. And then it's only in gay men. And then it's only in gay men and drug users. And then, well, it's in heterosexual people. And then, oh my God, any of us could get it when we're at risk. So people tend to kind of uh, deny their risk until it's uh, really, really clear to them. And that was a problem, particularly before the virus was isolated. And we found out that the virus had preceded the disease by so many years. And I would now estimate that when those first five cases of pneumonia were reported in June 5th, 1981, there were already 250,000 gay men infected with HIV. And by the time the antibody test was available commercially in 1985, there were 500,000 gay men already infected. Wow. And virtually all of them now have died. So that had happened well, well before anybody could have done anything. And it, it just shows the importance of a, such an infection. Dr. James Curran, thank you so much for talking with us today. And thank you truly for all of your work uh, in, over the past four, 40 years. Um, I think the world really, uh, really owes you a debt. So thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hope everyone has a great week and we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.